Hello, and welcome to this lesson on the uh, poetry anthology, and focusing today particularly on the power over people cluster within that. Now, the bell task, as ever, is the retrieval quiz, which is how we're starting. Um, as previously, if you follow the link in the middle of the screen on PowerPoint, copy and paste it if it's uh, in PDF form that you're doing this. Uh, if you're on YouTube, you can, of course, simply click the link at the bottom of the screen um, in that description section. Right, now, the overview for today's session. A bit like last time with the, uh, the society cluster, today we're looking at the power of people cluster. So the challenge is to recap the power of a people cluster, to draw together those ideas, try and get some of those, um, you know, that familiarity with the poems back in place. But hopefully a lot of you will also push to the Aspire outcome, which is to explore uh, the poet's authorial choices in the power of a people cluster. So to look at the choices the poets are making, the effect those choices have, etc., etc. Now, for our starter task today, we're looking at images, symbols, and concepts as well. And concepts, remember, are those key themes that run throughout lots of the poems, but they're also linked to the other texts that we do um, in NET as part of our GCC programme. So you'll find they, uh, there are links on here to Macbeth or Romeo and Juliet, depending on which one you do, uh, to DNA or to Inspector Calls, again, depending on which one you do, and of course to Christmas Carol and to Jekyll and Hyde, depending on which one you do. Now, the idea is for these, the first one you need to decide to which of the poems do these images or symbols link? Some of them will apply to one poem, some will apply to several. For example, the boat could very easily apply to, of course, the prelude, but also to something like kamikaze, where the boats and the fishing boats are also referenced. Now, the other thing you need to do then is to look at the pink box on the right hand side, where it contains that list of those key themes that run through all the things we do, and try and decide how those images and symbols link to those, uh, those concepts as well. If you can provide a quotation from the poems that you're going to reference, so much the better. By way of example, let's take the, uh, let's take the middle one at the, at the bottom, uh, these uh, metal <laughs> braces. What these are, of course, are manacles. And the obvious quotation is, of course, the mind-forged manacles from Blake's poem London, which is the poem we looked at in our last session together. Now, the quotation is, of course, the mind-forged manacles, uh, which is a very, very neat one. In terms of the concepts that that links to, we would of course think it to power, control and authority, because that's all about the idea of these, um, these imposed restrictive ideas and customs and social um, niceties and conventions and all the rest of it uh, that Blake's writing about, and the internalisation of those things. Um, is it to do with conflict? Possibly, potentially, relationships? Possibly. Society? Definitely. So power, control and authority? Definitely society. Um, and possibly also something like identity, but really the two key ones, society and power, control and authority. So work through all six of those, please, and decide which poems they link to. Uh, try and make links then to those key concepts, and it can be more than one concept, in the same way that it can be more than one poem, and do try and provide quotations for those. As previously, if uh, you're doing this on the uh, on a printout of the lesson, you can write all over it, and if you're not doing it on there, you can of course simply make notes in your exercise book, your notebooks, do make sure, as previously, they put a logical heading at the top, so when you come to use this for revision, that you know what it is. Should take about five minutes or so, maybe up to ten, but you know, in that sort of time frame. Now the next task is to try and link together poems in the anthology in as many ways as we possibly can. Now on the left hand side of your spot, in that pink box, we have got the 15 poems that we study as part of the Power and Conflict Anthology. Now the idea is, you're going to try and create a kind of a web on your page, which links together all these poems. Now there isn't a right order to this, it is entirely up to you in terms of which ones you link and how you link them. So the idea is, start with the poem that you are most confident with, the one that you're most used to applying, you know, your go-to poem from all these 15. So for me, it might be something along the lines of, say, the poem Exposure. I'm a big fan. It fits with, obviously, nature and war and identity and the group and the individual. And um, memory fits in there as well a little bit. You know, it, it's a really, really good poem. So what you then do is you make links to other poems. And on the line between them, you write what that link is. So Exposure has a very natural link to Storm on the Island, for example, in terms of weather. Now, ideally, actually, on my, on my web of all these poems, I might expand that a bit and put weather, for example, the fact that the weather is attacking people. That is an obvious link there in terms of that motif of weather, that, that symbol, that image that runs through both poems. For Charge of the Light Brigade, there's an obvious link as well, which is the view of war. Of course, they're very much a contrasting view of war um, in terms of the honour and the glory of the Charge of the Light Brigade and the 
the pointless, almost futility in exposure, though of course he does justify why they're there as well uh, towards the end of the poem. So, lay it out how you, 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 you can, make the links between the poems, and on those lines, write down what those links are. Try and fit all 15 in, uh, if you can. You will find that lots of the poems uh, will have lines across to lots and lots and lots of different other poems. So using different colours might also be a good idea. If you're going to look at, say, key themes, for example, you can always have green for nature, for example, or red for war, or something along those lines. Right, and we have another vocabulary builder task, uh, the semantic field idea. Same as last time, the idea is that you take that key theme, this time it's power over people, and that you try and build up a semantic field around um, that particular theme. As previously, this could consist of synonyms, it could consist of simply words that link to the key theme somehow. It could even include words that contrast with it, that's absolutely fine as well. So with power over people, I might go for words such as oppression, repression, depression, suppression, and other shun words as well. But there's others you could use. All right. So I try and help build up um, that semantic field. Eight to ten words is a minimum. More are possible. Don't forget, as ever, there's a whole bank of words that will be relevant in terms of inside the recipe book, um, which you can access through the online learning section, uh, all through your academies, and that really needs to start being uh, your, your Bible in terms of um, your English learning for language and for literature, uh, because both are available. No more than about five minutes on this, that should be a nice quick task, but lots of vocab you can try and build in, you should be able to apply to the poetry. Right, that brings us to our poetry dissection for today's session. Now the poem I'm going to ask you to look at is the poem My Last Duchess by Robert Browning. As previously, you've got the poem on the left and the right-hand side in the yellow box, you have those prompts. And these are exactly the same prompts as last time, because these are, of course, the things you should be looking at in terms of any poem you come across pretty much in any context. As previously, there may be a couple of words on a couple of things on there that don't apply to the poem. That's absolutely fine if so. Um, but you'll find that most of them apply pretty much all of the time. Now, with narrative, of course, um, as a starting point, you may well find this one. with this one there is a very, very clear narrative, slightly more so than there was for London. With London, there was, of course, that structure of walking through the city streets, following uh, the gaze and, um, you know, looking at kind of where his eyes are going and following the sensory details he sees, and then going to that deeper thing, but also journeying through the day. So there was a sort of narrative to this one. For more, even more so, because you get that dual narrative of the perspective of the Duke and, of course, him recounting what happened with uh, his, 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 old, his previous wife, um, his last duchess. So that kind of thing with a narrative as well, um, and so on. So narrative form, perspective, vocabulary, language and lineation, imagery, context, themes, and linking. Don't forget, ultimately, at the end of that, to draw together to the green box, which is the idea of what's the overall effect of those authorial choices, what is the poet trying to do in this poem, what is Browning's intention, and don't also forget that if you are struggling to remember the poem, you can, of course, click on that link at the bottom of the screen, which will take you to the two-minute talk-through for uh, Miles Duchess, which is available through the NET uh, English online learning section of YouTube. Um, and there's lots of other good bits and pieces on there as well. You have also got lots and lots of notes on Miles Duchess available to you through um, both the podcasts, which are available through the online learning website, and, of course, in the recipe book as well, which is obviously a wonderful, wonderful piece of work. About 10 minutes on this, uh, ideally. Don't forget, you can annotate on the screen uh, if you have this uh, printed out in front of you. If you don't, you can simply make notes, and that's absolutely fine, but make sure there's a logical heading that you use. Right, that brings us back to our poetry profiles. Now, as with last time, you're going to try and profile this poem, and the boxes are the same. Perspective, form of language, structure and narrative, four quotations, language and imagery, themes and context, similar to, and contrasts with. Again, as previously, you can add these boxes if you wish to, to your annotated copy of the poem. That's absolutely fine. Uh, if not, you can do it, draw your own version if you'd rather, or fill in the boxes if you have it printed out in front of you. Uh, whichever you want to do is absolutely fine and not a problem. Don't forget this is a clear summary that's going to help you in terms of revising for exams, uh, and essentially this will become the key points you would write about in terms of this poem wherever possible. So about five minutes, ideally, on this. And that brings us to our plenary. Now on the screen you have got four provocations. As previously, these are four statements that are more or less accurate or that at least are open to debate in terms of the poems. Now the four focus on different ones. 
So we have London, we have Mars, Duchess and Ozymandias. We have Mars, Duchess by itself and London by itself as well, uh, with a slight comparison to the emigre in that one. So the idea is you work through them, you decide to what extent do you agree. Um, but remember, of course, that the answers for these are unlikely to be yes or no. It's going to require a bit more uh, thought and a bit sort of uh, some, some deeper inference uh, and discussion than that. You can, of course, do these as mind maps if that's useful. You can write all over the sheet if you have a printout in front of you, or you can make notes if that's helpful as well. Failing that, simply do it in your head, but do please run through, decide what you think. When you've had a chance to do that, press play, and I'll run through a few ideas that might be relevant um, in terms of you know, things to pick up, things to think about. Right, let's start with that first one. In London, Blake focuses on how institutions have failed to improve the lives of the poor. Well, the institutions are very clearly there. They're very evident throughout the poem, as I'm, I'm sure you will have noticed. Uh, we have, of course, um, the blood on the palace walls. We have the blackening church, you know, um, you know the chartered Thames. There's lots of a sense of organisations about companies, about the rich and powerful people, about religion, uh, and all these things, actually, uh, which are intended to make society a better place. Uh, the church, of course, should be helping people, and yet it's a blackening church. It's a church which is both physically blackening in terms of you know, the pollution at the time and that sort of thing, but it's also blackening in terms of its reputation, its moral standing is becoming uh, worse, it is becoming blacker because it's not helping people, it's not doing things it should do. But also it's blackening because it's making society worse, that the corruption of the church, the corruption of religion, the immoral behaviour of those involved is actually serving to make society a much worse place. So actually with that one, it is fairly comfortably accurate. Although it's also true, it's not just about institutions, it's also about society as a whole and about subgroups within that. Uh, don't forget that Blake is particularly sympathetic towards you know, groups such as women, uh, children, um, ex-soldiers, and that sort of thing. Uh, let's go for the bottom left. Both My Last Duchess and Ozymandias offer deeply negative views of power in general and masculine power in particular. Well, My Last Duchess, that's again fairly hard to argue with. The Duke's power is oppressive. It is repressive, suppressive, and again, all those if words um, this time around. Um, but his power is all about maintaining his own standing. It's all about um, you know, the victimising or the downplaying or the treading down of other people in order that his power is confirmed and asserted. And we see that all the way through his treatment of the wife, we see it through the ordering around of various people throughout the poem, um, and the exertion of control over the painting itself. It is all about shoring up his sense of authority, power, dominance, and so on and so forth. And it is also very much linked to masculine power. Uh, the Duke's power is very masculine. It is assertive, it is commanding, it is possessive, and very much based around status, hierarchy, dominance, and in particular, male dominance over uh, women, in the form of, of course, the, uh, the Duchess. In terms of Ozymandias, again, is it a negative view of power? Well, it depends on the sort of power. And this is perhaps where the debate comes in on this one. In terms of the power of the pharaoh, in terms of Ramesses II, in terms of Ozymandias, as, as he's called in the poem, um, it is a negative view. He has a sneer of cold command. Um, you know, the arrogance, the hubris in terms of him um, presenting his power as he does. But at the same time, his power is, is futile, empty, short. It is not a lasting thing. Um, because as we know, the statue has crumbled. All the signs of his works have sunk into the desert sand. Even his um, face is, is that, that half-forgotten visage, that half-sunk uh, visage. Um, so in Ozymandias, power is negative, but it's also temporary in terms of human power. Whereas the power of nature, for example, and the power of time are both overwhelming, uh, powerful, and not necessarily presented as negative. Um, although obviously Ozymandias would probably view them that way. And of course, with Ozymandias, there's also the possibility of looking at the power of art and the power of the artist, which again is not presented in a negative fashion. So yes, they both present negative views of power. However, Ozymandias also offers some less negative or some alternative viewpoints. And although Miles Duchess is very much about masculine power, and Ozymandias is very much about the assertion of dictatorial, dominant, authoritarian power, whether Ozymandias you view it as, as masculine power is, is more open to debate. Right, in Milo's Duchess, Browning strongly implies that the Duchess has been unfaithful to the Duke in thought, if not in deed. Well, there are various references in the poem that people often use to justify an interpretation 
um, that the Duchess has, has treated on him. You know, the, the bough of cherries, for example, and the symbolic um, resonances in terms of, you know, cherry picking um, and loss of virginity and so on. Um, but we can also talk about things like, for example, uh, the idea of uh, the mantle lapping of my lady's wrist and a sense of flirtatiousness. However, what you notice very much is that that point of view comes from the male speaker and comes from the men who are interacting with the Duchess. She herself does nothing about the mantle lapping over her wrist too much. This is not an action on her part. You know, there's a sense of her blushing, but whether that's from you know, um, arousal or embarrassment, it simply isn't clear. So the implication that the Duchess has been unfaithful to the Duke, in thought, if not in deed, actually comes from his point of view, it is his interpretation. There's not actually a lot of evidence that she has done anything wrong um, in the text. Um, although people do use the, you know, of course, the cherries, the riding of the mule, potentially, um, and various other bits and pieces to justify it. It's difficult to justify, except from his perspective, I would say. Bottom right, then, Blake in London offers a more realistic view of city life than is offered in, say, the emigre. Well, that's interesting. Um, Blake's London is a realistic view of city life. We get uh, the grubby streets, we get institutions, we get the negativity. He doesn't offer us any positivity, um, that might be realistic or not, as the case may be. In the emigre, what's interesting is we're offered two different perspectives. We do have the point of view of uh, the writer as a child. And her childlike perspective, when city comes to her on its own white plain, for example, and the memory of it being sunlight clear, there's a degree of clarity about it and beauty and purity about it. Now, there is a sense in which that is naive, a childish perspective and not realistic. However, the memory itself is something that is protective and powerful. So the city for her exists as an idea, as a concept, as an image, rather than as a real thing. At the same time, the actual city is something she does engage with. Um, we get the idea of the city, um, you know, um, it may be at war, for example. And we get the idea of the shadows being cast and so on. Um, so there is a, an acceptance of the fact that the city, um, as uh, in, in reality, can be a negative place and can contrast with um, that rather pure, innocent, childlike view of the city that um, lives in her memory. But the contrast between the two is valid, and it's a friction which offers um, a much deeper perspective, arguably, uh, than Blake offers, and it is a self-conscious, self-aware image as well. So again, that last statement is very much open to discussion, it is open to debate. And that brings us around to the end of our lesson. Now hopefully uh, you all feel you've achieved the challenge, which is to, to recap the power over people cluster. And hopefully a lot of you will also feel you managed to head to that aspire outcome, which was to explore the poet's authorial choices, although obviously we've been leaning very heavily uh, on minor Duchess by Browning. Thank you very much for your time today, and I will see you in our next session together.